Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is hearing, is hearing me. Can you please confirm that everyone is hearing me? Can you please type in the chat? Okay, perfect. So we have a huge crowd tonight, and I am extremely excited to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Valentin Mayor, and I will be your host tonight. And we're going to do amazing things today because we have a very nice startup lineup. And let's kick it off. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here. And I'm going to share a few words about uh, why we are here and about the agenda. First of all, I want to share a few words about DMS. Uh, so DMS Accelerator was born in 2019 under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program, aiming at overcoming the bar barriers of data-centric SMEs and startups in Europe. Uh, now, during this program, what we have done is that we have provided training, matchmaking, and support to startups to help them build an European data market. And the best are here with us today to pitch. So the agenda for today is that we're going to go into pitching as quick as possible. Uh, we have a tight agenda today. So please, startups and jury members, please be mindful about our time. We have six minutes to pitch, OK? And four minutes for the Q&A for each startup. Um, I'm going to go through some more administrative things uh, a little bit later. Now. This event has been made possible by DMS, but there are, uh, there are a few companies uh, behind this event. And I would like to name the partners. So we have Zabala, we have The Next Web, we have SpinLab, Spheric Accelerator, Bright Pixel, and we are supported by Ogilvy, University King's College London, the University of Southampton, iPetector, and W3C. So thank you everyone for all your hard work until now and uh, yeah let's let's go further now startups uh who are you gonna pitch to today you will be pitching to jury members who will be looking for a strong idea an addressable market and of course the financial model so make sure you deliver the most you can okay great now, before we move further, we got the jury members with us today, and let's let's invite them to present themselves. So first of all, we've got Margarita Volpe. Margarita, please. Hi. Nice to meet you. I hope you can hear me well. Perfectly. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much for this session. I'm glad to be here with you today. My name is Margarita Volpe. I work for uh, Zavala Innovation Consulting. So. Uh, uh, which is part of uh, DMS uh, program. Um, I'm an innovation funding uh, and management uh, specialist. For Zabala, I've been working in Ernest Young as well with big uh, um, client company, especially in Italy. I've also been myself uh, an external evaluator for the European Commission uh, for the SME instrument, now AC Accelerator. And I'm uh, now in my work with Z in Zabala, I'm mostly focused on uh, implementing cascade funding programs, including the, the process for the selection of, uh, of the uh, SMEs and applicants that are going to be funded. So I'm very glad to participate here today, and I'm looking Thank you very much, Gargarita. Moving forward to Andrew McCarron. Hi, good afternoon, Valentine. Hey, Margarita. Valentine, Very I'm, fine. I was about to say, Valentine, Valentine looks as though he's studying hard at the moment. He's going, right, how am, gonna, how am I gonna keep this all on track? And he's going, Andrew, that's great, but would you please just tell everyone who you are? It's fine, don't worry. So my name's um, Andrew McAdam. I'm the Managing Director of Microsoft for Startups in Europe. I also run teams out of LATAM, MIA, India, and Australia Pacific. Um, Microsoft for Startups program, um, and Valentin, you mentioned a few things that you're going to be looking for. And one of the key things I always look for is how clearly the startups articulate their value proposition. So this is the point where I also test myself. So I say the Microsoft for Startups program helps startups who want to scale their business, 
by reducing the complexity of engaging the Microsoft ecosystem and accelerating their revenue growth. So there you go. There's problems and opportunities all over there. And I'm looking forward this afternoon to hearing how the startups themselves articulate this as well. Thank you very much, Adam. Adam, Adam, Adam. Andrew. 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 And moving forward to Marcel van der Heiden. Hey, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> on TV, I'll, I'll work on that. Uh, hi, everybody. Marcel van der Heijden, I'm a partner at Speed Invest. We are an uh, early stage uh, seed and pre-seed fund uh, in Europe. We invest in European tech startups, anywhere from 150K to 1.5 million. Um, I'm part of our technology investment team. I have a you know personal interest in, in everything around data, data infrastructure, data privacy, data security. So very curious about the startups that we'll be presenting tonight. Fabulous. Let's move on to Michael Hoff. Yes, hello from Leipzig, uh, Germany. Hi, guys. Um, well, thank you for having me here. I'm uh, really looking forward for the pitches. Um, uh, if I'm not in a jury, I typically work at Deutsche Bahn, um, which is uh, one of the biggest transport and uh, logistics company in the world. Uh, we are moving about 150 million people per year in long distance and 1.9 billion people in short distance. And of course, we also work with startups. Uh, we have um, two companies for that, the DB uh, Digital Ventures, who are actually investing in startups, and DB Mindbox, who are taking care about uh, getting startups to work uh, with Deutsche Bahn and to get their products uh, into Deutsche Bahn. Uh, I, for myself, work uh, for a the DB Systel, which is the IT subsidiary of Deutsche Bahn, and I'm um, kind of a venture developer, uh, so I'm a business angel slash investor for internal startups. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward for, to, to the pitches. Perfect. And we are on a very tight schedule, and I will please ask you to accept my moderation. And startups, going further on, we are speaking to you. Thank you for the jury members. Uh, we, you'll, have a, you'll have a hard job tonight. And startups, today you will be acquainted to this sound. This sound, five minutes, 30 seconds, announces you that you have 30 seconds more to go. Please do not stop. Please continue until the end of your six minutes time. We will start with the Q&A session that will take on for four minutes. I will say stop and I will mute you unless you don't stop yourself because we need to keep the agenda, okay? Great, thank you very much. Now, for the participants, audience, we got a networking tab for you. And please use that in order to connect to other startups and each other, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's not make this event passive. Also, you or the audience, only the, myself, the jury members, and the startups will be able to share screen and do other, uh, other stuff like that. So you will not be able to talk or share your camera. Also, Startups, uh, please remember to share your uh, screen 30 seconds within the Q&A of the previous startups, okay? So we can we can switch quickly from one to one another. Mm -hmm. The audience can interact with us with the Q&A part, okay? So don't hesitate to address questions. My colleagues here, Rob and Adam, are here to take all the questions and address them whenever needed. And also, tip for the audience, double click on the slides window to make them bigger in case you don't see them enough. Okay, perfect. Now, um, I think we can get moving and we have our first startup, Infinite Foundry. Are you ready? You're sure <laughs> you're ready? Hope so. Let's see. Did okay. you... you will start. Five minutes. You will start when I say and you will stop after 30 seconds and when I say stop after the gong, okay? Okay, thank you very okay. much. So just quick check and you're off. Okay, thank you very much. So my name is Andrea Luz and thank you for the opportunity. I am the CEO and founder of Infinite Foundry, a 3D digital twin platform industry. The company was founded by myself and Bruno uh, is three years old and before that we we worked together for five years as, as engineering subcontractors to industry 
and we spotted this opportunity and we brought together a team, a team of gaming experts to address this opportunity. The opportunity is on industrial production planning and management. Every time that you need to change something in your own production or because in the market is asking you for more production or because you have a, a problem in quality, uh, the tools that you have available to actually manage these are very archaic Excel spreadsheets, dashboards, means that you have to work on a trial and error basis when you need to change something. This is time consuming, this is expensive, it is erroneous. So this costs a lot of delays that globally it is estimated that can be more than 500 billion euros spent just on basically the production line stopped because you are you are you are you don't know how to change it. So our solution is a 3D web platform. Our technology we virtualize the, the, the factory in 3D and we enable three services, production monitoring, production optimization, and virtual training of manual operators. The way the technology works is, is in the automatic part. So we laser scan the interior of the factory and our software automatically obtains first the building, then the production. Porters, AGVs, etc. We connect that 3D model with the sensors and the, and the controllers in the factory to obtain a 3D real-time animation. This is what we call a 3D digital twin. It allows you to remotely monitor in 3D the production. The same tool can be used for optimization, where you just change the, the parts and the sequence of tasks. Um, we can also monitor manual workers. And um, this is very important because many, many companies, they, they have lots of manual operations. In this case, we, we remotely monitor them, their motion, and we cal com compute their ergonomics. We also allow virtual training where they go immersively inside the 3D model to, to train on optimized tasks. We, we more recently have adapted this technology to sports training. This is, was our COVID project because the sports people could not train. So we actually uh, did the same and we adapted the technology to sports training that we are going to see add some value on the industry later on. Our value proposition is very simple. We are fast to obtain the 3D model. We, we allow it to, we compute a lot of data from the factory and we enable to see it in 3D, which is much more easy to understand. And we combine both human uh, workers with manual machines. So this allows speed up of, of the production time to, uh, to change the production. It reduces downtime and it decreases the production efficiency. Our business model is very simple. We charge per square meter uh, the, what we digitalize and we enable a 10 time saving in 12 months. Uh, basically, we are an industrial gaming company, meaning that we combine the accuracy of industrial legacy softwares with the gaming technology, and we can work on top of IoT, so we can bring visualization to IoT and to AI technologies. Our company has already the product validated in industry, mainly in the automotive, but we have branched to other sectors like energy and home appliances. The market size is very big. You are oil. Every time you talk about industry, the market size is very big. And based on 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 our on our market um, analysis, we predict that for us the the, the total um, market uh, uh, is around 8.5 billion. And just as I mentioned, so our growth strategy is, of course, focusing on industry, but bringing some of the passion from sports. And the reason why is that is because production managers, they actually love, uh, love sports. One of the things that we thought was for us to grow as a, as a brand, it's good that we also adapted the technology to sports. And we are using this to actually scale faster uh, our technology as we are a B2B software. We are focusing, of course, on the on the on a top-down approach, meaning that we're focusing from the OEMs to the suppliers. So we are using them as influencers going around the supply chain. And our, and our growth strategy is based on local sales offices in, in key countries and partnerships with companies that can, can help us on, on uh, distributing our technology to mid caps and to SMEs. And with that, that's how we predict a huge increase in our revenue. 
we have raised uh, 500k at the end of uh, 2018 that was mainly exactly to industrially validate our technology we also won some prizes with that like uh, more recently the iot challenge in portugal from a telecom company out east in portugal we have been operationally cash uh, cash flow positive since 2019 and we and, and now we are fundraising to scale our technology more in Europe. We are pretty much um, a Latino company, meaning implementations in Portugal, Spain, and also in Latin America. So we 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 we, we pretty we plan to. Okay. I'm not hearing. No, uh, Valentin, I think we might, we might. I think he paused at that 30 second, uh, 30 second bell there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, you have more, uh, a bit more Andrew, time. Your time is off. <laughs> Hope, hopefully, uh, German has got it. German, <clears throat> please, question and answer. Yeah, I, I have a question, uh, if that's okay. So uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting approach. Um, we, we've invested in a couple of, let's say, industrial uh, technology companies, mm -hmm. and, and the sales cycles and deployment cycles are typically very long, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of consultancy and custom work that needs mm -hmm. to happen. How does that work with you guys? Because that's, you know, that's that's sometimes slowing down growth, right? Exactly. It's a, it's a very good question. The answer, as you see, we have a bunch of tools and we say that we work in a customer from the head or from the tail, meaning that we can, we, you know, we, we can apply our technology from a laser scanning perspective where the, the customer wants to scan a complete production line or we can focus that on a simple, for example, manual task. And that is what speeds up a lot of our time. So we can be very broad or very specific to address some, some problem. You know, the mm. trick for you to speed up sales in B2B is actually getting the problem as fast as possible and solving that small problem. And then you go brief. That's why we have several tools that allow us, depending on the problem, to just apply one of the tools and then scale mm -hmm. to the application mm -hmm. of the other tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and typical deployment, like from the time you get uh, into the time you so, have uh, the, uh, the POC takes uh, two, three months, and the first pay, mm -hmm. paid project mm -hmm. will take another two, three months. So we would say mm -hmm. typical deployment is between four and six months to, from first meeting okay. to first uh, purchase. Yeah. Oh, nice. Thanks. Um, as a follow up, um, Andre, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, with regard, you mentioned quite Thank a few you. customers there at the moment. What's the largest yeah. single environment that you've actually yeah. mapped out at the moment, just size-wise? We have in Merce we have in in, in Mercedes Benz uh, five production buildings, which is one hundred and fifty thousand square meters digitalized. Fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one hundred fifty thousand. One hundred fifty thousand at a an okay. Sorry, I was just trying to work out, obviously, from your revenues at the moment versus how many customers you've got. So, so this year, sort of forecast revenue-wise, what is it? What is it that you're hoping to achieve? So we are hoping to achieve the one million revenue this year, and uh, uh, and and uh, and we 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 plan to scale five times for for 2021. You know, a lot of of those five times, at least one million we have already secured for 2021. You know, it was a, an a typical year, so some of the projects were postponed for 2021. Of course, but we already have some of those of, of so we we already know some of those projects that on the start on 2021. And and just a final one, just on a follow up to Marcel, with regards to how you're engaging with customers at the moment, how are you actually acquiring? Mm -hmm. Them. The the acquisition, you know, it's it's still that is one of the areas that we need to improve because it's pretty much on on a, on a word of mouth. You know, people hear about us, we get the, those connections, and someone from another company gets in touch with us. Sometimes even simple through LinkedIn. So that's pretty much, you know, it's still a very small company, pure technical, and that is exactly the area that we need to improve. You know, marketing, sales, you know, all of those parts that need to be structured properly. Thank you. If I may, um, you mentioned. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly, Margaret. Thirty seconds more. Okay, okay. So uh, you have mentioned that most of the, your um, clients are in automotive. How much time? Mm -hmm. And you have something in in energy. How much time did you needed, if any, to convert 
or adapt uh, your solution to the other industries? So, okay, yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. We started as an assembly line, you know, in process industries like energy. We just, you know, we focus on the on the core area. For example, the reactors, the furnaces. Mm -hmm. So it's not the full assembly line because there is no need. It's just it's just focus. So in terms of adaptation, is there is no need for to adapt. It's just a question that in terms of sales. You don't get the entire assembly line. You just focus on the process. You know the parts Andre, that are influenced for the efficiency. Thank you. Sorry, Valentin. No problem. No problem. Just uh, need to go further. So next one on the line, we have Yosh AI, who's going to start now. Okay. Great. One second. Hello. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Okay, thank you very much. My name is uh, Kasia Dorsey. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Yosh AI. In Yosh AI, uh, we are a deep tech company. We are specializing in conversational AI. Uh, so the problem we are addressing, as we know, that how much time, effort and budget, obviously, it takes for the companies to communicate with their users. Uh, therefore, we are offering solution of uh, AI virtual assistant. This assistant is developed specifically for the company in a voice as well as in a text version and then is deployed across many communication uh, platforms. Uh, we are a global Google partner, uh, thanks to many implementation we have done uh, in few countries. Uh, we are named the company that is changing uh, the retail. Also, we won many competitions thanks to this very innovative solution that we are offering to the companies basically like Alexa or Google Assistant or Siri, but dedicated for uh, the company. What is really unique about us is our team, also the technology that we have developed uh, with our team that in many aspects our uh, ML models beats already uh, Google performance. And we also have already traction for last two years, we are generating revenue. Up till now we are actually a bootstrap company uh, because we have uh, received R&D grant from a uh, European Union, a two million euro grant that allows us to exactly support our, our tech team and uh, during the COVID time we, our usage of our products grew free to 400 percent so from last year six people we grew to 28 people already today most of them within the data science 17 people engineering team the business team is still small and this is the purpose why we opening the a round for next year to grow our sales and become leader in conversational ai uh, across europe what is very special is that most of the people come from Samsung R&D Center having this uh, research, but also uh, business implementation uh, expertise. We also have people from Google as well as uh, Amazon. So basically what we do is we develop this uh, virtual assistant the, specifically for the company. And then we put it on a voice channel. It could be voice platform like Google Assistant, like Alexa, or it can be also connected to the phone line. And in this case, supporting uh, customer support for the company. It can be put even within the uh, mobile app and in both version also on social platform or our uh, client uh, website. So just this one agent is serving across all this uh, platform. And we are definitely focusing on the retail sector. We have implementation in UK as well as in the CEE region for uh, companies like uh, CCC or like uh, Media Mark that we're working with. Uh, but we also entering new sector like uh, banking and uh, working with Santander on or BNP uh, Paribas. And uh, so uh, basically what uh, we can offer this voice solution in over 30 languages in text in 60 languages. Now we operate in more than 10 languages, uh, 10 markets. And what is really interesting is that uh, we create next year will create over 3 million interactions. In terms of uh, the, uh, our assistant can support pre-sale or sale of the product, so the whole product discovery or delivering like um, uh, organizing appointments for the company, but it's also very strong on the customer support, automating about 80% of the uh, questions that are being asked to like a uh, human agent. So this is a big opportunity for the uh, company to increase um, the whole experience, but uh, also to save the cost. 
in terms of implementation, uh, we have developed a very interesting solution for uh, e-growth sherry with reordering uh, the food, so you can do it while you're driving. We have many implementations in the apparel sector. Uh, we're also working with media markers. We started in Poland, now we just won uh, media mark uh, Turkey. And again, here we're also supporting the whole search as well as the uh, customer support. Just to give you an idea, for a call center, 29% of the question is just one question, status of delivery. So just with automating this one question, we are uh, saving about 30% of time of people that can deal with more uh, complicated uh, questions. So for CCC, it's over 1 million interactions that we're handling. Media Mark, about half a million. What is interesting, 80% people stay and prefer talking to uh, the bot. Uh, addressable market is huge. We are today in 2020 with uh, about $40 mil billion uh, dollar valuation of the market with the next six years growing to 135. We're working with Google on the acquisition of new clients. We are global Zendesk partner. Also, we have a contract with PwC. And now we are building our own sales team. And this is what we are raising money for. Uh, our revenue model is typical SaaS model. We charge base fee and then we pay um, charge monthly uh, license fee plus uh, based on the of, uh, of our assistant in this certain uh, channel. We have uh, multiple stream of incomes. One is this assistant, but like, for example, for retailers, we also implement personalization engine annotation as well as a visual search. Now we are waiting um, information about uh, another uh, 3 million euro uh, grant from EU for our another R&D uh, area for a speech recognition. And we are just opening the round for five to eight million euro for to become a leader in the conversational commerce in Europe. Thank you. Perfect timing. Let's go to the Q and A session. Kasia, uh, how, how much revenue do you do, and what's your projection for next year? Maybe I missed it. Yes, and last year uh, we generated one hundred fifty thousand revenue. This year we'll generate about two hundred fifty thousand revenue. Actually, this is the first year that our products are going live, so I think it's a quite a, a significant. Uh, mm -hmm. Revenue next year, we are estimating over 2 million euro uh, revenue. And the reason for it is that just for one company like CCC, from one market, we are just expanding to 22 markets, and another company from one market, we are right away entering 30 mm, markets. Mm, so. mm. Yeah, 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 thanks. And Michael, you have an I, I was about to say, my, I was going to give Michael a chance just in case. Uh, because at Deutsche Bahn, we also make a lot of stuff about uh, conversational AI, and uh, we, we used to have the problem about specific words. Mm -hmm. Like at Deutsche Bahn, you have like all the, the funny names of uh, train stations, for example. How, how do you cope with, with the specific language of each use case? Yes, this is uh, this is and this is exactly our advantage of over uh, big companies because we train uh, the models exactly for the specific words and for a specific domain. So that's why I believe it's it's good to work with a smaller company that has uh, scientists and linguists that can exactly address all these issues. And we actually already have proven it to a few companies, also with pharmaceutical area that they said it's impossible to pronounce this uh, medicines and. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. So you use the standard, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 text-to-speech uh, framework or NLP uh, frameworks out there. Uh, and we you customize them. Uh, we combine a lot of technologies. Um, uh, we uh, we use, from text-to-speech and speech-to-text. We use Google, which now has the highest. Uh, the highest uh, results uh, for NLP. We also develop. We are using some of Dialogflow, but we also develop our mm -hmm. own system. Up till now, this is just for English and for Polish, but we'll be developing in further languages. We started mm -hmm. with the retail domain, but again, we'll be adding additional. Um, so basically, first we are ag ag aggregating this information from the clients to exactly train further for the specific domain. Yeah, yeah, and you, so you guys are based out of yeah. Poland. Yes, yeah, sorry. One of the things I'm still, because you mentioned at the start of your presentation, the differentiation, but the differentiation really came down to the team and, and the way you're funded. But from a product perspective, from a solution perspective, 
what yeah. what is different with yosh.ia versus the competition yes for example in the retail sector we are the only company in the world and this again uh, strongly researched that we just go beyond conversation we also implement search with it with uh, including visual search we also offering uh, automated tagging that we have developed a special models to tag uh, products within the uh, fashion domain on top of it we are offering personalization again to make the full very different shopping experience as well as a recommendation system so there is no other company that is doing it in the world this is just uh, within the retail sector yeah <laughs> uh, good, good specificity there because yeah okay <laughs> that's gonna be easy for you andrew i told you <laughs> thank you yeah. very much kasha also, my background is in business, so there is a lot of analytics and full of insights for the business, how to further grow the business. Thank you very much for your time. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank and you, Let's Dasha. move on to Esther. Esther, please share your screen and start. There we are. Do you see my screen here? Absolutely. All right. Um, Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jean, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Esther, uh, a technology startup delivering personalized flavor experiences. And I got the idea for Esther when I was running R&D and innovation for a large European grocery retailer. The reason why I love the industry so much is that in the face of a lot of competition, a focus on, on growth and cost control, they're still obsessed by the customer. Um, and many of them invest heavily in customer loyalty to make that happen. They use technology to offer unique experiences to every customer. Especially in a category like beer or wine, uh, we all have had that experience where you're in front of the aisle trying to figure out what you want. If a retailer would understand why a consumer likes what they like, that's when they could offer true personalization. But in reality, they offer products, promotions, and advice based on gut feeling and gross margin, anything but flavor. So I left my job to answer the question whether flavor preference is predictable. And just a spoiler, it is. We went to the University of Leuven together with my co-founders um, and joined forces with Cornell University in New York, uh, went into the lab and built a technology that truly understands flavor. And we turn that technology into a product that generates independent, personalized flavor recommendations. But if we wanted to be the best at that, we needed more and better sources of data from products and consumers. And so if you want to make that kind of good recommendation, you need to understand who the consumer is, what occasion they're buying for, their lifestyle and their preferences. On the product side, we do a chemical and sensory analysis using our proprietary methods, and we add product information like label and price into a database to form a fingerprint of the product. We also want to know all about the customer's flavor experience. So what they're drinking, in what context, and what stands out for them. Even their mood is important because it influences how they experience food. And if you want to capture all this information, we decided to embed our technology into a retailer's website, app, or in-store experience. For example, through a chatbot like I show here. We capture data about what consumers taste, buy, and prefer to understand their unique flavor profile. And we use that data to deliver inspiring, personalized recommendations. Just to be clear, Esther is an API as a service that is driven by flavor data. And building on the data in our platform, we can provide amazing insights for producers and retailers, driving new product development and assortment innovation. Currently, we have a, a model that is uh, driven by a lot of services uh, to our main two uh, product customer groups, sorry. But we're shifting our focus towards a SaaS model and a, and a model that generates recurring revenue. And the learnings that we're getting from our first customers are helping us with that. To give you an idea, some of our customers, Kouliot in Belgium, uh, the largest grocery chain there, um, is implementing right now our technology for their wine assortment. And given that they do over 250 million in revenue just in wine alone, uh, they're implementing Esther as a personal sommelier embedded in their website, a high value, low friction digital experience. 
And we just signed another smaller US craft based beer retailer. And we have a bunch of interesting breweries in the US that already use our services. To give you an idea of the market, there's over 470,000 stores in the US and EU that sell beer and wine. And we drink over 170 billion beer and wine consumptions every year. Our service creates value every time that API is used, leading to a market opportunity for these two products alone that is estimated to be $1.5 billion. We do believe that once we have enough data, we can also play in bigger markets and go into the $10 billion market that is that uh, CPG and grocery retailers spend on market research, uh, competing directly with companies like Nielsen and Kantar. Basically, what we're trying to do is we want to add the Spotify experience to food. And Spotify created a unique customer experience by helping listeners discover new music in a very personalized way. We're adding that same experience to grocery retail through wine and beer recommendations that are made for you. We have an amazing team to achieve this. We bring a diverse background in retail, data science, technology, and marketing to the table. And what connects us is a passion for flavor and food. We secured half a million uh, euros in pre-seed funding earlier this year to build out our product and technology. And we're gearing up to raise a 2 million euro seed round soon, focusing on fueling our growth, but also on executing further research and development. We are sure that consumers don't want more choice, but that they want to be more confident in the choices that they're presented with. If you're interested to create that world with us, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Great stuff, John. Let's go into the Q&A. Uh, what kind of, uh, John, thank you, first of all. Uh, what, what kind of flavors are we talking about? Okay, but you mentioned wine, you mentioned beer, you mentioned uh, food. Um, yeah. yeah, is this yeah, what you're so talking? We decided to start with beer and wine because from my scientific background, that's a world that I know really well. Um, but we're focused on ex on extending that reach uh, to, to co categories like um, spirits, chocolate, cheese, uh, tea, et cetera. All the categories where there is a lot of complexity and variety in the product and in the, in the assortment. Cool. And, and John, great. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, Thank you. What, what sort of uplift have you been able to show in sales or retention of customers? How are you, how are you measuring that and what impact have you been able to demonstrate? Yeah, so we're still working on these first pilots. Eh? So the, the quantified data is, is something that we're still working on. But, but studies have shown that the, the KPI that we are measuring and that we're, we're working on is that customer loyalty. Just okay. because we know that increased customer loyalty leads to higher revenue, higher frequency, a higher share of wallets. And it basically also allows a retailer to cover, uh, to, to optimize their cost structure in assortment and in marketing. And so we are trying to create an effect uh, through that customer loyalty that, that optimizes all of those KPIs. Thank you. Uh, what would be the user experience in a, in a brick and mortar retail environment? Or are, are we talking purely online here? No, we're also talking in store. Um, we don't really mm -hmm. believe in kiosks. Uh, we think that has been tried and, and proven to be hard to implement. Uh, what mm -hmm. we do believe in is that companies in store are trying to create a, a personal connection with their customer. And we want to offer our technology and make it available to store associates so they can help the customer through the assortment right. get better insight in, in all the data that is behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you need you need you need a, a history of consumption for a specific customer, and then you need to give them recommendations, right? Which is not always obvious in the store. Exactly. Much easier online, yeah. Exactly, and we need any kind of data. So the more data we have, the better the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Basically, the story. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Sorry, for me it was not one. Uh, maybe I lost this this part. Uh, this part. Who is the the. Um, the pain part. Uh, who are you selling this to? Is is the cost the end client? I mean, the individual who will pay a fee for the app or just the the, uh, the big store? Yeah. So it's the store the that pay a fee to and, it, uh, in, implement our technology. Correct. Yes, uh, and if this is uh, exactly um, doing being this the case, uh, um, is there not a risk that uh, I mean, 
Spotify is uh, is powerful because it's one. Maybe you are diff you have different versions of your solution that is customized per client. So one for Coriot, one for Carrefour, one another for whatever. Are aren't is how do you expect to tackle this risk? Yeah. Of, I mean, the platform not being so solid because he is not one and unique and one reference like it is for right, Spotify. Right. So, so at this point, we're starting to implement it through retailers because that allows us to grow much faster with a in a more efficient way. At some point, what we hope is that the customer that sometimes goes to Colgate and sometimes goes to Carrefour that mm -hmm. they will tell us, hey guys, why don't you link the profiles? And as soon as we can do that, the power of our platform will, will increase. But that's something that we're, that we're hoping that will be driven mm -hmm. by the market. How much time have you estimated more or less it will take in your best scenario? In our best course? scenario, it would take uh, somewhere between one and three years. It depends really on okay. adoption. Okay, Thank thanks. Thank you very much, thanks a lot. Everyone. Thank you. Let's prepare analytics and a small announcement after analytics will have a 10 minutes break. So analytics, please share your slides. Okay. Just one moment, please. Yes, please. Startups, please have your slides ready when you purchase. in. Perfect. Go. Okay, uh, thank you, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm Joel, co-founder and CEO of Analytics, and we are building one solution to manage whole beer kegs logistics. The problem we are solving, it's the brewery's lack of control over the beer keg sales in reverse logistics. The beer kegs are filled at the breweries, are sent to distribution centers, wholesalers, until they get to the retailers, where the beer will be consumed, and when the beer keg is empty, it needs to go back to the brewery using the reverse logistic process. During these logistic processes, breweries lack control both on the keg's location and the storage conditions. And due to this, they have high costs with lots of kegs every year and beer storage. We are solving this problem with a smart keg management solution that we deliver to the clients as a service that includes a tracker device that gets attached to the beer kegs and reports location information and storage conditions to a cloud platform using IoT connectivity, where all the data from the keg's movements and storage conditions are mapped out on the distribution chain locations. So the device monitors the keg environment, reporting both indoor and outdoor location of the beer kegs. It monitors its temperature and movements. It's able to automatically de detect when it gets in or is getting out any of the current logistic venues and is able to decide if the changes in its environment are needed to be sent in real time or just log the information for being sent later and with that really expand the battery life. At the cloud platform, we provide dashboards with real time business KPIs to the clients. The solution is able to automatically map all the distribution chain locations by overseeing all the CAGS movements. It able, it's able to deliver instant inventory per location, including the CAG status, if it is full or empty, and delivers a set of business KPIs like the rotation rates per location, the CAG shelf life monitoring, the transit times within those distribution chain locations, and of course, the track and trace of each via CAG. In terms of the choices that exist in the market, this is not really a new problem and a set of solutions exist already, but all of them are based on passive tracking technologies like QR codes or FID tags. And, and they have uh, no capability to deliver real-time visibility everywhere the keg might go. They require the installation of additional equipment like RFID antennas or even personal doing manual scans on the beer kegs. They aren't able to control the storage conditions, neither the shelf life of the beer kegs. With active tracking solutions and technologies like we are using, we are able to solve all these problems at once with one solution. In terms of the market, so the, the beer market is a highly concentrated industry. Just the top five brewing groups in the world have 58% of the world market share. They use 113 million beer kegs from which every year 8 million get spoiled due to wrong storage conditions and 6 million are lost per year. Our addressable market for this 130 million cakes is 1.8 billion euros, but just targeting the three biggest European groups like AB InBev, Heineken and Carlsberg, we will be looking to 850 million euros. 
the technology we are developing can be uh, applied on different returnable packaging. Anyway, we believe that the, 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 the way to bring value to the clients is to really fulfill all the requirements of the business case. And we are targeting one by one different returnable packaging. For now, the beer kegs in the near future, we hope uh, liquid gas bottles or industrial racks for the automotive industry and even shipping containers, all of them can have bring value using our solution. In terms of our business module, we delivered the full solution as a, as a service to the clients, including a setup fee that's applicable in the first year and afterwards an annual subscription fee for beer cake that we have divided for different target clients. Craft breweries, normally smaller with less than 10,000 beer cakes, the setup fee is 18 euros and the annual subscription fee for beer cake is also 18 euros per year. And above 10,000 beer cakes, the price drops to a setup fee of 12 euros and an annual subscription fee per beer cake of also 12 euros. So we are finishing our first year of activity. During the first half of 2020, we secured a business angel funding. We developed our first prototypes and started to contact our uh, target customers. On the second half of 2020, we were selected by uh, Indico Capital Partners for an acceleration program powered by Google here in Lisbon that also includes a safe investment. We launched our minimum viable product that with what we have initiated some customer pilots with AB InBev and Carlsberg Group. In terms of our needs, so we want to accelerate the product development and integration of integrate market feedback. For that, we need to design a new device that is able to fit in different cake types. We want to improve the way our distribution chain location is gathered, expand our customer base, and have integration with our customer systems like SAP. We are four founders. We have been working together for almost four years now, and we cover the main areas, strategic areas of the company, from the hardware, the software, sales and marketing, and the management. Well, thank you for your time, and that's all. Great stuff, Joao. So, Q&A. Fascinating. Thanks a lot, Joao. Really interesting. A um, bunch of questions about the device itself. Um, cost, durability, battery life. What what sort of mm -hmm. you mentioned these as as sort of elements, but how much does it cost to make it? Well, yeah, it, it's highly dependent on the volume. So the the IoT business, we are highly dependent on the, the amount of uh, devices we'll sure. be uh, uh, producing. Uh, but what I can say that the first prototypes we were able to produce them at below fifty euros per piece. Uh, the second batch we are already below twenty euros. Uh, but the target when we start producing on the hundreds of thousands of devices is to go below 10 heroes uh, for just for the device, including okay. plastics, batteries, electronics, everything. And then durability, do they last as long as kegs do or do they need to be replaced more often? Well, yeah, um, our target is to make the batteries last for the amount of time the kegs need to have a maintenance. So meaning the, 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 the batteries should last between five to seven years without the need, need to be changed, yeah. Wow, <laughs> big battery or very low power consumption, that's a challenge. No, very low power consumption, both because of the technologies, the communication technologies we are using, both CATAM, narrowband IoT are all part already of the okay. 5G framework and designed specifically for this type of communications and the ability that the device has to understand when this uh, uh, event needs to be sent in real time or can I just log the information and afterwards send it later, maybe once per week, once per day, as the client wants, and with that also save a lot of battery. Great, thank you. Um, one question about the market itself. I mean, if, if a cake's getting lost, I, I would assume mm -hmm. that the guy who, who who's losing the cake has to pay the cake. Um, uh, how's this market working? I mean, is it, is it like in, I don't know, in Germany where you have a, a bottle and if you don't return it, you don't get the money back? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're correct. But the thing is, normally what you pay to have the keg, the cost is less than the cost of the keg itself. So if you want to do something with a keg, it always compensates you to do it, even losing the money on the, on the, on the, the refund that you've made. Uh, anyway, the, the biggest problem is of course with the, the kegs that get lost, the beer that gets spoiled, and all the investment they need to do at the brewery to keep the, 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 the ferry crew rolling. Because 
that just need to fill kegs to send out to the market, maybe the kegs will get back, but two or three months is later than they should. So they have always problems at the, at the brewery to have the, the necessary kegs to fulfill the, the market demand. One of the, of the advantages is to make the kegs uh, rotate faster, and with this, you can reduce the keg fleet that you have. Yeah, and the working capital. Is there, do, do breweries have an infrastructure to, to manage where their kegs are? Like, do they have systems where they track these things? Because you guys generate a lot of data where they, mm -hmm. they maybe don't know really what, how to use it efficiently, right? Well, yeah, well, that's a really good question. Well, some of the breweries have already made some uh, experiences both with QR codes or RFID, RFID tags. Uh -huh. They understand that they just give a, a smaller view of what's happening with the kegs because they are just able to cover part of the distribution network. Um, yeah. With us, they don't need to install any infrastructure, so we just need to attach the device to, to the beer kegs and all the data will come from our platform. We don't see the value of doing individual track and traces of each via keg. That's why we have made our efforts to be able to map out automatically all the distribution chain locations and do an analysis over those locations, not specifically on what's happening with one keg, but trying yeah, to compare the movements, the time the, the kegs get parked on those places, what's the differences, between to, to the others, what about monitoring the temperature? Will this beer be spoiled before some other yeah. places? But do the comparisons on those places. That's the yeah. key. Yeah. What, what is the cost of a keg, a new keg, just out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, eight, um, $100 on average. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Because so, somebody is collecting a lot of kegs, right? If yeah. 6 million get lost, then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They are used for other things, and you know, with this, a uh, big uh, uh, event of the craft breweries, uh, so uh, the kegs are needed in the market, and a lot of kegs. Yeah, are yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Joa. Thank you very much. So, jury members, we've had four startups so far. Prepare because we'll have two more sets. Uh, we're gonna take a small break now. Before we do that, some small key points that we didn't have time in the introduction, but I need to send them over. The startups are looking to get a prize, actually more prizes. So for the startups that are jo have joined us today, there are three prizes that you're going to fight for. Uh, first of all, company marketing video made by global advertising agency Ogilvy. Second, it's a 90%, 90 percent. yeah, you got it right, 90% and personalized Ask me anything with HubSpot CRM software you're going to use for your sales. And top DMS startup going into investors one-on-one. -on -one. So make sure you give it your best. Jerry members, thank you so far. We'll let you drink some water. Maybe do a little bit of a gymnastic to get back in. <laughs> and we'll be back at exactly 17 hours. Okay? Thank you Great. very much so far. Thank, Thank you. you. In a bit.
Okay, hope everyone refreshed themselves. Uh, before we go in, so we're gonna have another batch of four. For the audience, I'm gonna, quick reminder, please use the networking feature to meet the startups and investors and each other, if you want. If you are an investor and you're watching us and want a personal introduction to any of our startups, just email us at hello at datamarketservices.eu and we will make sure we will provide you with a connection. And for the jury members, thank you so far for all your attention. I know it's not easy. And uh, please do remember to navigate to our private sessions at the end to deliberate, okay? I think I'm gonna be the last the last light after this uh, event <laughs> for all the pauses. And <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? One of the toughest jobs, Valentin. I think I think telling people to cut and stop and it, it's never an easy thing to do. So mm -hmm. fair play, keep it up. Thank you, Aret Matek. You have the floor. Please share your screen. Your presentation. Jerry members, please be prepared for more awesome presentation. Joel, please share your screen. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Please share your screen. Awesome. Yes, I will do. Uh, there we go. Awesome. You can start now. Awesome. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Joel. I'm the CEO of Way. We're an ETH spin-off and based in Zurich, Switzerland. We care about understanding human motion. So what is it we're building? We like to see it as the visual engine for, yeah, for what exactly? Well, basically everything with a camera. So just capture this opportunity. There's over 20 billion active devices with normal camera already out there in the world. But just seeing is not perceiving. In order to understand human motion, we integrate expertise into our technology. That means we're basically bringing a fully virtual physiotherapist onto your, onto your laptop, a personal coach onto your phone, or we build the technology into smart glasses that can actually support those professionals in doing their analysis. Now let's capture this opportunity a bit better. There's a huge trend that we're going into. Telehealth will grow from last year nearly 45 billion to over 250 billion in the next five years. The trends that support this are the healthy lifestyle and the quantified self that has have been around for quite a few year, years now. 2020, well, thanks COVID-19, sorry about that, but virtual is the new normal. We're per with our technology, we're perfectly hopping onto that trend. Then the World Health Organization has recognized this problem, meaning all the health insurances out there are trying to reimburse you for verifiable physical activity. Perfect. Let's see what we're building. Let's go into the achievements and how we want to tackle this huge opportunity. Our product takes a normal camera image builds a precise, anatomically correct computer model of this and provides you with live feedback and tracks all of the progress. I've listed quite a few of our ongoing and con uh, concluded development in here, but what is our USP for our clients is the completely hardware independent, system agnostic um, product that we offer using any camera, any system plus the library of over 50 movements that, that's constantly growing that we ship out of the box. Some more achievements. Well, with my two co-founders, Ben and Patrizia, we have been uh, bootstrapped for quite a long time, over 10 full-time employees by now, before even we got investment by this guy, me, Alex. Well, Alex has been a real pioneer in the field, selling his computer vision startup, the CUDA, to magically in 2017 before scaling the Swiss division from 20 to over 70 people. Now, our investor and very close advisor is the head of the ETH Zurich Artificial Intelligence Center. 
We've also built up quite a huge network, of course, with the DMS Accelerator, but also quite a few other stakeholders, granting us over 350,000 in equity-free grants, helping us to stay bootstrapped for that long. We've also started or are currently in process of starting collaborations with world-leading institutions like ETH Rehabilitation Engineering Science Center or the Leibniz Universität Hannover. We have collected over 3 million of images of people actually working out that we can use to train our networks. And we have clients with re uh, resounding names like the number one uh, Swiss Health Insurance CSS and we're currently all the rest of the client are very full. I know this slide will probably overwhelm you, but let's focus on the number on the bottom right corner. We have over 10 million, uh, 10, <laughs> yeah, that would be nice, no? Over 10,000 in monthly recurring revenue and over 100,000 in project revenue. As I said, the pipeline being pretty full. Uh, let's talk a bit of our vision. Well, the end goal where we see our technology applied is in this whole cycle of the fight against the number one cause for physical disability worldwide with the amazing name of musculoskeletal conditions. And in this case, in German, a complement des Bewegungsapparatus. Well, the fight against this is built on three pillars, prevention, diagnosis, and rehabilitation. We believe our technology can serve as an expert companion in your pocket, on your phone for any of those situations, and at the same time make sure that the same data is collected at every stage. We want to reach this goal, and probably it's a bit further down the road than just 2024, but we have uh, defined exact action steps where we want to go from where we are at now, with a proof of concept, available in the market, and a kick-ass product, to the Series A in 2022, where we really want to scale our product market fit in the prevention and fitness space and be the market leader in that market segment. You can help us. We're still uh, doing an ongoing pre-seed round, leading to the equity seed round in April 2021. 200,000 are still open, and I do hope that some of you might be interested to join us in this future opportunity and a noble cause. Thanks. Great energy, Joel. I'm sorry for the mistake with the name initially. No problem. Q&A. Great, I think this is our opportunity. Quick, quick. So, this um, is question time, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's about say, Marcel. I think it is. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks. Um, so, so Joel, um, look, uh, really interesting. But, but one of the things that stood out to me as you're going through was companion. So, when I hear companion, sometimes I go, "Where's where does this really fit? Who's actually going to be the one that's going to bear the cost of doing this?" So, where do you see your real customer? So, we decided some time ago, after we launched our own B two C products, that we will be much better off enabling other products in the field. Mm -hmm. Coach, everything of that. That's why where visual engine is coming from. We're fueling other applications in this field, and in the end, we're not looking to replace all those efforts in those different fields, but rather augment them, support them, collecting the data from them and helping them make better decisions for their patients and preventing um, these. So, so lovely answer, but but when when you do that, what's what's the problem that you're really solving? Like, how do they do that at the moment? Um, the problem is most of the clients uh, do not have any um, any option to do so yet. But what is for motion analysis are large scale camera systems consisting of I don't know 10, 20 cameras. It's uh, uh, sensors like full body suits of eye music. It's uh, and well, fitness apps are not able to do that. Uh, augmented reality glasses are not able to use all those sensors. Um, yeah, they have no option to sell it. Okay, thank you. In my line, there were some cuties, so I didn't really got uh, who is paying uh, for. For, for the solution, are you uh, 
expecting insurance or the individuals? Yes, so we direct clients, which are mainly fitness apps, it's uh, actual okay. rehabilitation apps. Those license our service on a monthly uh, base fee plus even a revenue share on most of the products that we're currently in. Additionally, okay. and the very fine of the physical exercise, health are looking hard, uh, very much into the field of being able to reimburse costs that arise uh, for the for young consumers and paying back part of those fees. Thanks. Yeah, it's two very different markets, right? I think from from an, from an investor point of view. I, I like the the B2C market, let's call it that. I, I think you know might feel like a little bit of a small market. Um, you know, as you will be you know be, you'll be part of a, of the B2C apps. I think the healthcare market is a huge market. It's obviously a little bit takes a little bit longer to break into, but um, I mean that's that's the big one, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. to clarify. We first launched our own B2C product. We completely got away from that. We took the stores mm. because we realized, okay, we talked to 10 of all of the 10 base fitness apps. We know that everybody's looking into this technology. Now we're integrating it into one, and nobody wants to build it on their, uh, on their own. In five years, I can assure you that any fitness product on smartphones, smart TVs, uh, computers in the web will have some kind of motion analysis integrated. Mm -hmm. And as the B2B approach, we are this library of different exercises and actually integrate the expertise of uh, experts in the field. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joel. I really like the energy, but we need to move on. Fortunately, of course. Thank you very much. Let's have Beatrix get ready. Please share your screen. Hello, Jalan. So, please share your screen. Okay, sure. Uh, no way, it's not okay. Can you see? I can see it. Yeah. Start. Please go ahead. Okay, so, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Javad. I am the CEO and co-founder of Filtrix. Filtrix helps energy managers to uncover energy saving opportunities in commercial building using data analytics. Businesses are surrounding with lots of energy data, but few of them understand and can use them. Meet Luis. He is an energy manager responsible for several of his buildings here in Lisbon, Portugal. Last month, he received the energy bills for his properties and he found that the energy bills is double. I mean, you just take some spreadsheets, some uh, pen and papers to understand what's happening. He spent a few hours and then he was frustrated at the end and uh, didn't know what's happening. What was happening. So he called uh, an energy consultant. They meet and then the consultant then, uh, produced an energy report. Luis implemented those uh, uh, suggestions in his properties, but six months later again, the energy price doubled. This is not only the problem of the Luis, but lots of organizations and companies facing the same problem. And it's basically because the success of every energy improvement needs regular benchmarking and assessment of energy performance. But usually this is expensive, time consuming and complicated. Uh, the, market, the market is still, uh, unfortunately, the papers and the spreadsheets, which is very time consuming and inefficient. There are other solutions in the market like Honeywell, Johnson Control and Siemens. These are expensive solutions, takes lots of training and uh, it's hard to integrate. And there are a few innovative solutions in the market that gains kind of new traction. What we do is in Viltrix is we provide affordable, simplified and easy to integrate solution for buildings through energy benchmarking, sustainability indexes, energy cost prediction and recommendation. So uh, the companies and the building manager that use our product, it shows that we can save up to 80% of their, their time to manage a portfolio of properties and 
on the annual basis, it can save between two to 10% on energy costs. And compared to the market leaders, our product is 10 times cheaper and 20 times faster to implement. So uh, we have a web-based platform to monetize, monitor and analyze energy consumption. So we connect the, the energy consumption source in commercial building to our platform, and then we provide our services like benchmarking, analytic, prediction of the consumption of the energy, recommendation, and so on, on top of this platform. So um, worldwide, Europe represents 30% of all the buildings uh, and 25% of the building stock in Europe is related with the commercial buildings. So talking about the global building analytics, we are talking about the $19.5 billion in 2027 with the CAGR of 12.2%, which is a really big market. In terms of traction, the idea was started in 2019, but we incorporated the company in 2020. And so far, we have um, mainly, our customers are mainly through the pilot project and contracts, mainly here, municipalities and office buildings here in Portugal. So far, we have raised 160,000 euro, which includes 50,000 euro from only co-founders. Uh, we have been recognized by European Data Incubator as one of the data driving startups in Europe by EDI in 2019, by TMWA for Digital, as one of the most promising deep tech startups in 2019. And last but not least, we've been featured by UK Department of Trade as one of the top 100 European startups in sustainability. So I have two quotations from two of the customers, David is an energy manager for the VPS, which is a smart meter utility provider based here in Coimbra in Portugal. And when they use our services, it says that the utilities have to save lots of its time to manage portfolio of properties. Joe is an energy manager responsible for the cash cash ambient, which is a cash cash municipality here in Portugal. And once they used it, we found it that using batteries could help them to find energy saving opportunities in their office buildings. So we have a multidisciplinary team composed by business development, product management, software development, marketing, and sales. And with the top tier advisor based in California. I myself am an entrepreneur with more than five years of expertise in building and shipping digital products, mainly in the data, sustainability, and energy. I have uh, sold my previous company with the help of my co-father, and I've been able to raise more than one million euro for the previous company. So we are looking by the end of the year to raise around half a million euro for the next 12 months and that would be used for mainly for the hiring sales and partnership let's say market development because we have a product that was proved in the pilot cases and so on so we want to bring this in a larger scale to the market and thank you very much um, i wanted to invite you to be part of our mission to bring data energy data accessible to everyone thank you very much we are in time. We did have some sound issues. Uh, the jury members, I hope you got the idea. So please go ahead, QA. Michael, you're on mute. Michael. Yeah, we can't hear we you. We can't hear you, Michael. <laughs> Unless can, you don't. I can can do it. Still can't please, hear you. Please unmute, my, Michael. So just just Let's while go. we yeah sorry Let's Michael just while we're waiting um just a quick one I, I wasn't really is it just a dashboard I wasn't really clear what the solution was so it's uh, so let me explain how it works so usually I mean we have two type of product one is just you need to take a picture from your bills and upload in our dashboard okay it shows you it benchmark the energy consumption of your commercial building okay. first. And second one, it predict how much would be the energy consumption in coming months. For example, we are in November, but would be December is much more cooler than now. You know, without the temperature situation, how much is your uh, how much is your your consumption? And then it by analyzing and understanding how the energy is used with different times in commercial building, it provides recommendation. For example, in the one of the customer, I can I can present an example. The customer that we have in Cash Cash Music, but they have EV cars, electric cars, and they plug it in the most expensive time their cars. And once they use our system, they understand that it's not an efficient time. So they mm -hmm. unplug it during the eight morning to uh, from eight to nine in the morning. They unplug it and then unplug the cars for the night. So this is a kind of recommendation that we provide so they can make it 
much more energy efficient. So there's no there's no monitoring of live. It's literally based on bills. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, there are two products. First product is just bills. The second product is if they have an energy smart meters, and then right. we can connect it to the API to our platform. And in that yeah. case, it would be live, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, like. Um, uh, monitoring of the energy in the in buildings. Okay, and what what systems can you plug in? What what is your API open to? Uh, uh, in the Portugal, we have a system agnostic. So as long as they provide an API which would be uh, compatible with our system, we can connect and customize it with our platform. So there is no specific requirement as long as they can send the data. Usually they have a cloud platform that gives the data every 10 or 15 minutes, and then you can call the data from the cloud and then show in the dashboard. Okay, well, hopefully Michael's back. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, I think, Andrew, you just asked a question. I was asking, uh, how do you measure the consumption? But I think this was the question you were asking. Okay, great. If I may jump in, uh, you mentioned commercial which other type of uh, building or is your solution targeting in this moment so so at the moment we're building the use cases and so far the customer that we have is the municipality and those who use office building let's say like incubator like a, you know uh, those that has like a commercial you know, office spaces let's say but it could be used extended i mean in the future we wanted to extend it to perhaps to hotels to the banks the schools and so on but at the moment we're focusing this kind of uh, niche market so basically places where there are people I cannot... not industrial plants oh. We are not at the moment uh, focused not on an industrial plan and not on the residential plan, on the commercial environment, let's say. Thank you very okay. much, Javad. Thanks. This is clear. Thank you, very Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Let's move on to Chris from Advanced Infrastructure. Chris, are you with us? Chris, are you with us? Uh, we cannot hear you. We see you. We cannot hear you. How, how about now, guys? Excellent. Please share your screen, okay. Chris, and Fantastic. let me know when you're ready to go. Please talk. I am I'm ready to go. Thank you, guys. So, hello. I'm Christopher from Advanced Infrastructure. I'm CEO and co-founder. We, we, we trace your energy supply back to its source so you can discover uh, that your true carbon footprint. The problem is that renewable energy certificate markets and physical power markets are disconnected from each other. You can buy dirty power and offset it um, against, your carbon foot, uh, against your carbon footprint by buying renewable energy certificates. It's a bit like sticking an organic label on a, on a non-organic banana. Renewable certificate markets disconnected from physical power markets are not creating the low carbon outcomes that they're supposed to. It's not sustainable, it's not equitable, and it's going to change. To respond to this need, we've built the world's first big data platform that uses the real physics of the electricity network to trace power flows from generator to consumer. This allows companies to know their exact carbon emissions in real time and with hyper-local precision. Buyers and sellers of renewable energy certificates use our platform to calculate discounts and premiums based upon the routing of power flows between each generator and consumer. This is an impactful and it's a disruptive data service that changes the market dynamics of renewable certificates trading. Together, corporations transact over 53 billion euros per year on renewable energy and carbon offsetting. Our products reduce the cost of carbon offsetting and evidence green branding to shareholders and customers. The origin of our company goes back to our work with Volkswagen Group. So Volkswagen knows exactly where every subcomponent of their vehicle comes from who made it, where it was made, and how much it costs. But what they don't know is where the energy comes from. We solved this problem for them by tracing their energy supply back to its source, reducing their carbon offsetting costs by 
Since then, corporations such as Microsoft, Google, and Amazon have all begun to trial similar approaches. Our end users are corporations, but we target end users directly through our channel partners, power exchanges, energy suppliers, and system operators, totaling a serviceable obtainable market of over 10 billion euros, growing at 23% year on year. We're trying our platform with channel partners across these four market segments at the moment. We're particularly excited about our partnership with ePower, the UK's largest PPA exchange, forming a beachhead into the power exchange sales channel. And we're now looking to work with other exchanges in Europe shown here on the map. We intend to grow through a B2B SaaS business model um, and channel partners will be other power exchanges and marketplaces throughout the US and Europe. Our end users are corporations who procure renewable energy through power exchanges and our partnership with, with ePower moves us into the revenue generating phase with annual recurring revenues next year expected to be £400,000 based upon a user base of 12 corporate customers adopting our platform. Our target user base is a long list of 800 European corporations whose energy costs are over 5 million euros per year. And the average revenues per end user is modeled at 33,000 with customer acquisition costs of 5,000. So you can see that there's a, a strong sus sustainable revenue model un underlying this. We have an excellent team of data scientists and energy experts who's recognized uh, by EDI, the, the European Data Incubator, as, a top 18, as one of the top 18 startups, um, uh, data startups in, in, in Europe in, in their 2020 cohort. We have financial support from Innovate UK and Horizon 2020 and our lead investor, a leading European energy fund. A bit about the team. I myself am a former um, um, Eon decentralized energy systems um, manager who, who have brought a lot of their assets into the wholesale trading markets. Our CTO is a highly experienced at building world-class, highly scalable cloud-based solutions. And we're supported by an exceptionally talented team, both on the commercial and on, on, on the technical side with four PhDs. What do we do that's different to our competitors? It's our technology stack. It's 100 times higher resolution than the current method. This allows us to trace customer power flows to zip code levels of precision. And no other platform offers this level of, of, of resolution at the moment. Quick word about exit strategies. They're driven by multinationals acquiring new technology platforms in order to enter new markets. And on the right hand side are some of 2019's uh, buyouts and strategic partnerships between mid sized tech firms and large scale utilities. Deal sizes were up to 55 million in the sector last year. Closing off, our funding round is open now to investors who can leverage over 200,000 euros of public funding already committed to, uh, to our project to help expand into the EU markets. So I invite you to join us and be part of the hyperlocal energy revolution. Thank you very much, guys. Fabulous, Chris. Before the Q&A, I just want to let you know that I'm going to add a one minute left warning for the Q&A also. Go ahead, please. Um, sorry, go on. Margarita, was that you? That's fine. Sorry. Um, Chris, a great presentation. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting. One thing I'm, I'm just trying to understand. At the start of it, you mentioned about the fact that it was about transparency. But as you went through it, you actually talked about cost reduction. Which one is it? Are you, is it, is it, you know, is the purpose to really give visibility or is it about reducing cost for customers? It's to make it fair. So there are some corporations who are already doing the right thing. Right. And because of the current framework, they are being penalized. Right. So the corporations who, who are in the right space already have most to gain. Um, and moving to this system, more transparency, you're going to see that. And it's also going to direct investment where it should be going. So it sort of tries to do both at the same time. Wow. OK, great. Thank you very much. And uh, the quality of your data. Um, is that is that you i mean do you have an unfair advantage in terms of where you get the data or are you using public data 
uh, in a in a better way, let's say. So we try to use public data, uh, open data sources, mm -hmm. because uh, credibility is really important in mm -hmm. our model. Um, so so all the information to date is based upon open publicly available data. Mm -hmm. We can see the need for for sort of better algorithms and, and integrating more expensive data sets, which we'll love to do when we can afford it, mm -hmm. um, which might be a bit closed. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we tend to develop on open source stacks to try and avoid that type of, uh, of, um, of, of uh, credibility issue. Right. And, and so you, you make recommendations to corporates around where they source their, uh, I don't know, green energy, let, let's call it that. Um, and the business model, they pay you a fixed fee per month or you get, you get uh, I don't know, you get a, a, a share of the economics? So it's volume-based pricing and exchanges yeah. charge around 1.5% uh, for energy transacted on their platform. We come in around about half of, half of that. Yeah. Um, we think that's pretty competitive uh, and in line with the industry. But are you then competing with the, with the incumbent exchanges or are you partnering with them? No, we partner, yeah, we add yeah. value. Yeah, okay, okay, interesting. Cool. Great. How much are you raising, by the way? We're looking around about a million, mm -hmm. um, a million to 1.5 uh, in quarter one and quarter two next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Great. Cool, cool model. Just about 30 seconds. God, I had loads of questions. I was trying to let everyone ask <laughs> questions. So, um, so with regards to go to market at the moment, how are you actually um, accessing more customers in the market at the moment? So we're initially doing a two pronged attack. So we're going through the channel partner e power I mentioned, yeah. but we're also doing direct approaches to let's say flagship corporates that um, are, are like. Uh, oh, Valentine, that wasn't you, was it? Power <laughs> outage. <laughs> No, it wasn't. <laughs> we are very sorry for that. I don't know what happened. It wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be able to connect one-on-ones and continue with the questions. We'll make sure you, you will be, have your chance. Andrew, right. let's, let's, go, let's go to Jimmy from Taiken. Jimmy, are you with us? We'll not kick you out, don't worry. <laughs> you hear me all right? Please share your screen and, uh, and let's go. We'll have a break afterwards, so... You'll be able to connect with, uh, with the other ones. Thank you. Go ahead. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, Jimmy. I'm co founder and CEO of Tyken, where we are creating a future of opportunity through digital identity uh, with partners such as um, the Red Cross, uh, Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, UNDP. We've been doing this for about three years now. Um, we were one of the first founding stewards of Sovereign purpose-built uh, network for identity, uh, were later followed by uh, IBM, Cisco, CETA, T-Mobile, and about 60 other companies. Uh, so far, generated over 200K in revenue, um, raised 1.8 million in funding from Ayon Musterbrook, uh, Booking.com founder Case Cola, amongst others, um, won uh, some prizes and awards, including something that Andrew was moderating uh, next Web 2020 uh, about a month ago. Um, so. Um, still in 2020, uh, identity issuance and verification processes are still broken due to siloed, inefficient, and often still paper-based identity systems. Um, in our increasingly digitizing world, the degree of friction caused by these systems is uh, quite staggering. Um, from global metadata correlation leading to ele election meddling, uh, to enormous privacy breaches, costly KYC duplication processes, um, all the way to 1.2 billion people who are still without um, identifying documentation today. So needless to say that identity management needs fixing. Now, cue self-sovereign identity. Um, the next step in the evolution of identity management where organizations can finally issue tamper-proof, persistent digital credentials that cannot be destroyed by any man-made or natural disaster. Uh, and people can finally regain autonomy um, over their data with high degrees of privacy, security and control um, without fear of eternal loss or fraud. Uh, we're also, instead of having to over disclose personal information now to every verifier, I can do so selectively um, or better yet, even mathematically prove that something about me is true uh, without having to disclose the actual data. So for instance, instead of Alice um, showing her whole passport to prove she's over 18, uh, she can do so by just disclosing her birthday or even better yet, 
um, prove it mathematically. Um, so I can kind of hear you think, you know, oh, Jimmy, this, uh, you know, this sounds, uh, this sounds great, everything, um, but why then are we not using this yet? Well, because it's complicated. Um, until now, SSI has not been particularly user friendly or easy to integrate and also entirely smartphone exclusive, um, requiring dedicated dev teams, uh, multi-week training and other cost prohibitive investments uh, to actually use the technology in a, in a meaningful way. And on top of this, for many use cases, there's a regulatory requirement of all stability and impossibility with all the information stored on the edge. Um, now, like I said, until now, because um, with Anna, SSI becomes simple, just put an API call away. Um, and if you need apps in a highly intuitive admin dashboard, we have that. Um, and if you need feature phone compatibility for uh, over a billion people who are yet to be connected to the internet, we have that. And if you need uh, auditable web wallets, well, we have that too. Um, built on open source tech and battle tested with the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and UNDP for issuing work permits to increase refugee employability in the private sector in Turkey, ANA is the way of integrating SSI into your workflows uh, for smartphones, feature phones, and web, leaving no one behind. Now, before COVID, uh, Juniper Research already estimated that the global IM market size by 2024 would be over $20 billion. Uh, of which SSI-based uh, identity management would be $1 billion. Um, and like I said, it's before COVID, uh, where everything, or at least a lot, is being done remote right now, and before Anna, because now, also, we can sassify it. We can finally drive more adoption, because we can actually do this on API call basis. We can charge for requests. We can charge for connected wallets. Um, and this really lowers the barrier to adoption of the technology as well. So now, of course, I don't do this alone. Um, do this with a team of absolute magic makers uh, and have done for a long time. Um, these are people, uh, ex-mobile network operators, uh, experts in distributed systems, um, identity management, blockchain, um, and yeah, uh, build a, a huge part of the, the actual infrastructure of the technology as well. So really proud of that. And um, yeah, currently raising uh, 1 million, um, please, Come see me, schedule a call, talk, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Wow, that's on schedule. Jerry members. Where do you start uh, kind of implementing this? Because I think there's very strong network effects, right? Uh, so you have to kind of find your beachhead. Um, good good question. So, so we've, um, we've actually tried to leverage the a credibility of our partners, um, uh, especially the larger partners like um, Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and UNDP. Uh, mm -hmm. So for instance, now after that uh, project in uh, Turkey with the Chamber of Commerce there and everything, uh, it's actually yeah. now gone up to the Turkish presidency's office to actually enable uh, some investment to come from there and to be able to, for us to tap into the, the private sector. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, th those sales cycles are quite long with government. Uh, so we actually focus um, a lot on uh, contained multiplayer use cases now, um, yeah. or single player use cases to really get this started. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's uh, from the private sector side, mainly on the financial uh, sector. Uh -huh. So, okay. I, I was thinking like maybe like develop, developing markets could be a good one, right? Because they don't really have a good, good infrastructure and you kind of leapfrog a lot of... Uh, for sure there's yeah. uh, there's one party um we're kind of working with now i, I can't say too much about it but um mm -hmm. they're, they're essentially doing micro loans in uh, in asia yeah. uh, and they have quite a, a big basis for that um and they want to use this um uh, w one of our pieces of technology to be able to uh, generate an extra revenue stream from um essentially selling their uh, qualified leads onto their partners that are in different geographical areas that they can't mm -hmm. access yet. And mm -hmm. this is an, a very easy way for them to essentially reuse the KYC that they've already done on people. Yeah. Is that like the biggest use case, kind of KYC uh, delegation, let's say? No. It, it'll, uh, in my opinion, it'll be the most lucrative use case. Um, mm -hmm. That, because mm -hmm. it, it has been, you know, it, it's, it's been a global problem for a very long time because the data has kind of been like a hot potato, like, you know, who's who's willing to hold this. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. 
Mm. Uh, so, so I do think that that would probably be the most lucrative of use cases. Mm. And, and, and people like banks would love, well, that's a question to you. Would, wouldn't people like banks love to kind of, uh, you know, be that anchor for identity and kind of roll this out and, and drive adoption with other financial service institutions and whatnot? For, for sure. We're actually um, uh, looking at uh, mainly challenger banks and the other mm -hmm. party that we're yeah. talking about now is also technically a challenger bank. Uh, yeah. because they are unbundling the uh, the traditional bank and they tend to have a lot of partners in their ecosystem so you know yeah. they, they do some of the banking themselves but then they have a partner for loans then they have a partner for mortgages and they have a, a separate partner for micro loans and then you kind sure. of already have those ecosystems in which you can really smoothen out a lot of this um a lot of friction yeah yeah, yeah. super in um so uh, just a very quick one jimmy what do you see as your biggest barrier to adoption um, biggest barrier to, to adoption, I'd say, is, um, li like I said in the presentation, that it's quite complicated. Um, and so now that, that's been the bi biggest barrier to adoption. And now that we've kind of abstracted away a lot of the complexities, um, it, it should be a lot easier to, to give a value proposition without having to explain the whole of SSI, which yeah. is... Uh, kind of a mistake that well it's it's not per se a mistake because we, we had no other choice um, mm. but that was a big barrier before that we basically had to explain this whole thing and like the whole infrastructure and, and the whole yeah. technological part or well, really yeah. you know people shouldn't have to know that no no absolutely and i understand and i absolutely heard that loud and clear but what's the next sort of thing that might stop it from accelerating um i think especially in uh europe um because we talked to some challenger banks in, in Europe as well. Yeah. Uh, and some of them, um, they are still indecisive because they don't really have a clear view yet on uh, GDPR wise, because right. it, it mm -hmm. lies in a certain gray area because this is new, right? Because the yeah. data lies with the user. So um, a lot of them, they find it really interesting and they're like, yeah, we've been trying to get something going in this uh, same area for a while, but we're hesitant because reusing KYC, that's that's a very gray area in this regard. That's so right. I think that is is going to be uh, a barrier okay. in Europe, at least. Cool. Thank you. Jimmy, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. We are mindful and we thought about jury members who need to think, clarify ideas. So we're going to go on another short break. Jury members, we hope you get to refresh. Okay. Audience, you use the networking sessions. Don't hesitate to connect with, you, with, with each other. And we'll be back in exactly 10 minutes. Well, actually less now, because we used one minute. <laughs> Take care. See you Thank soon. you. See you soon.